morning and uh, welcome to the March 9th meeting of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors. Uh, we will start this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor McCary and followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, our first item on the agenda this morning is the State of the County pre uh, presentation by myself. So good morning. Uh, I'm honored to serve this year as chair of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors and have the opportunity to give this State of the County address. First, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the dais, Pete, Eddie, Larry, and Dennis. It truly is a pleasure to serve with you. Um, I'd like to also thank our chief of staff, uh, Tammy, and our board rep, Alicia, who have to put up with us and meet the desires and needs of five different bosses. So thank you, ladies. Our CAO, Jason Britt, and his staff, my fellow county elected officials, our department heads, and of course, our employees whose hard work and dedication exemplify the core values of why we exist. Well, 2020 didn't go as we had planned. Without a doubt, it was an extraordinary year as we faced unprecedented challenges with COVID-19, making its unwelcome arrival into Tulare County. In just two days, we will mark one year since our first COVID-19 positive case. COVID-19 is still the county's immediate priority. Our response actually started in January of 2020 when our public health staff implemented protocols and limited exhibitors from outside the United States coming to the World Ag Expo. Numerous sanitation stations were set up throughout the grounds, and fortunately, there were no positive cases stemming from the Ag Expo. Then it all changed. Immediately following the declaration of a local public health emergency due to COVID-19, our departmental operations center coordinated a countywide response to the pandemic, working to prevent further spread throughout the community and safeguarding the health and wellness of the public. All departments rose to the task, from securing and distributing highly limited PPE supplies to local healthcare facilities, to providing directions to schools, our healthcare partners, businesses, and community partners. A joint information command center was created, so messaging was concise and consistent. County employees stepped up in big ways to continue serving our residents. And I wanna direct my next statement to directly to our over 5,000 employees. I could not be prouder of your allegiance to the residents of Tulare County. Many of you place the safety and well-being of the public over yourselves and your families. When things didn't go the way someone thought they should, you took the hits and you took the criticism but through it all, you never lost sight of your mission. My heartfelt thank you just doesn't seem like enough. The CAO, in partnership with department heads, immediately implemented work from home and redesigned business processes to continue county services. We also implemented Microsoft Office 365, a cloud-based subscription service that makes remote work easier and more effective. Our clerk of the board and her staff had, have put in place protocols that protect the public while maintaining transparency. One of those protocols I see as I look into what would usually be a packed chamber, limiting the number of people allowed. But while limiting attendance at our meeting has been implemented, the opportunity to participate and make public comments has expanded. Citizens can now call in public comments and I believe this provides more and easier access to this board. Our new agenda management system, PrimeGov, improves efficiency and standardization, providing an intuitive public search portal. And I hope that one day we will have the capabilities to offer live stream video of our meetings. We allocated over $48 million in CARES Act fund to invest in critical life-saving measures and economic support for Tulare County residents. 
This board authorized $5.2 million for over 1,000 small business grants that were administered through the Workforce Investment Board, $8.6 million for public health response, COVID-19 testing, contact tracing, and financial assistance to local hospitals, $1.1 million for rental and housing support, and $3.4 million for food support programs. COVID-19's impact has been significant. To date, 48,399 total cases. Unfortunately, we mourn the 776 Tulare County residents who lost their battle with COVID-19. Let us offer a moment of silence for them and their families. Thank you. I'm hoping the worst is behind us. COVID cases are down, our hospitalizations have stabilized, and we are focusing on administering as much vaccine as we can get our hands on. The sooner we can get Tulare County citizens vaccinated, the sooner we can get back to our pre-COVID lives, which means our citizens go back to work, our businesses begin to prosper again, and our kids are fully back in school. The academic and emotional stress on our kids has been devastating. To date, we have vaccinated over 62,000 county residents. Our points of distribution have been well run and welcomed by the community. Through the efforts of this board and our Central Valley colleagues, we called on the governor to increase the allocation of vaccine to the Central Valley. And I'm happy to report our allocations have tripled over the last three weeks. And during the governor's visit to Tulare, yester Tulare County yesterday, I believe he remains committed to making sure Tulare County gets their fair share. As hopeful as we are about the vaccine returning us to some sense of normalcy, now is not the time to become complacent. As our county begins to see improvement, we must remain steadfast in following CD gui CDC guidelines to prevent further spread, which means mask up, avoid high risk situations, social distance, and wash your hands. As if a global pandemic wasn't enough, 2020 saw the largest wildfire in Tulare County history, the Sequoia Complex Fire. The SQF burned more than 175,000 acres and destroyed 232 structures. Firefighters from throughout the United States, along with our own Tulare County Fire Department personnel, bravely and successfully defended the communities of Camp Nelson and Ponderosa. Thankfully and miraculously, there were zero firefighters or civilian fatalities. Despite the effects of COVID-19, the county continued to function. This board continues its dedication to support public safety. We gathered masks and socially distanced as we cut the ribbon on Fire Station 1, the first fire station built in Tulare County since 1996. The new location will reduce response times and its strategic location will provide backup for nearby Exeter, Visalia, and Tulare during mutual aid incidents. Station one will also see a two personnel staffing model. We have also committed $1.8 million in funding for the purchase of a new ladder truck. The Sheriff's Air Unit has two airplanes partnering with the Sheriff's Ag Unit that have proven effective to combat ag crimes in our county, significantly reducing the impacts of theft to our agricultural communities. The gang and narcotics enforcement teams have had a very successful year seizing hundreds of pounds of illegal drugs and seizing over a million dollars in drug trafficking organizations' finances. Our Sheriff's Department also remains focused on technology, such as body-worn cameras by patrol and jail staff and drones with night vision capabilities. Our probation department has now consolidated our three Visalia locations into the new headquarters in the former Kmart building on Noble Avenue in Visalia. Our district attorney and his staff, after three years of investigations, filed 40 felony and six misdemeanor criminal counts against former HCCA CEO Benny Benzivi. Benzivi was taken into custody just four months later. I would also like to highlight that the district attorney was part of a six county joint prosecution that resulted in a guilty plea from Golden State killer Joseph D'Angelo. 
D'Angelo was responsible for a 13-year multi-county crime spree, which included a murder in Tulare County. Agriculture is the driving force of Tulare County's economy. Our annual crop report was released in 2020, and we remain in the top three counties for the state with a 4% increase in overall from the previous year. The total comes to over $7.5 billion. The leader again is milk at $1.6 billion. With the onset of COVID, the Ag Commissioner was able to work with the California Department of Food of Agriculture and Cal OES as surgical masks, gloves, N95 masks, and sanitizers were distributed to our farm workers and their families. This was an effort never done before, and they were glad to play in an important part in supplying and distributing the needed personal protective equipment. This effort continued with the Healthy Harvest program that found hotel rooms for COVID positive farm workers so they could isolate and keep their families safe. The Ag Commissioner also joined in with other county departments as the Community Care Coalition was formed and joined by other area organizations and state officials to meet the needs of the ag industry and those that work in it. Our resource management agency maintained operations throughout the COVID-19 environment. The permit center was staffed and operational for all but seven days total during the year for COVID cleaning. Despite the remote or reduced staffing, they had one of their biggest construction and permitting years to date. On the public work side, there were over 53 miles of roadway rehabilitated countywide, along with major sidewalk projects in Early Mart, Ivanhoe, and Pixley. Many smaller communities throughout the county saw accessibility enhancement projects. Our traffic op transit operations maintenance facility was completed and will be the home of our TCAP buses along with a CNG fueling station. Last September, a $16 million grant was awarded from the Federal Department of Transportation to assist with the State Route 99 and Commercial Avenue interchange in Tulare. This federal grant will help to complete the $53 million price tag for that project. This is a great example of how local, state, and federal agencies can come together for infrastructure needs. May also saw the first time in five years that the communities of Yedham and Seville could drink water from the tap without boiling it first, as the replacement water system in the works for over a decade was completed. On the economic development front, we reestablished issuance of Williamson Act preserves and contracts resulting in tax savings to property owners without diminishing our general fund revenues. The long-awaited Valley Fuel Travel Project in Goshen was completed at the Highway 99 and Gosh uh, Betty Drive Interchange. On site, there is a Chevron gas station, Starbucks coffee shop, the first in unincorporated Tulare County, Subway, and made-to-order Indian food that I can attest to as of this past Saturday night is delicious. <laughs> 2020 also saw the opening of the Darling Hotel in downtown Visalia. As you may recall, this historic building was formerly owned by Tulare County and had been vacant for more than a decade. Ground has broken for the Sequoia Gateway Project at Caldwell in 99, and this will be the site for a Valley Children's Hospital Medical Specialty Clinic, Cahuilla Delta Surgery Center, and various highway commercial businesses. Even as COVID raged on, our registrar of voters processed a record high 148,677 votes, as well as provided four days of early voting during last year's general election. During the COVID lockdown, the outdoors and open spaces became crucial to maintaining wellness. County parks received much attention during 2020. We partnered with CSET to install a new basketball court at Ledbetter Park, there is a new disc golf course at Pixley Park. Balch Park received major electrical upgrades and the end of the trail memorial at Mooney Grove Park received much needed improvements. Lighting and fountain features now enhance the beauty of this renowned statue. Animal Services has continued to respond to calls for service to the public throughout the pandemic with over 5,500 responses to animal related calls 
while also providing care for over 3,500 animals. They provided critical evacuations of animals during the SQF fire by opening three evacuation centers for large and small animals, housing 280 animals. Their live release rate has steadily increased and is now at approximately 90%. Our library staff was busy in 2020, not only continuing to provide services, services through a modified pickup system, but with the introduction of Pop-Up Tulare County. This new bookmobile will expand not only library and literary service, but will also include opportunities for science, technology, engineering, art, and math throughout the county. The bookmobile was even put to the use last week in helping to deliver vaccines to Early Mart and Porterville. <clears throat> Tulare County remains on solid fiscal ground. 2020 saw the adoption of our largest budget to date, $1.45 billion. As we heard last week from our auditor controller tax collector, Cass Cook, we are financially healthy according to the most recent comprehensive annual financial report, an independent audit. I cannot go any further without thanking our CAO Jason Britt and his exceptional staff for being mindful of this board's desire to maintain conservative budget protocols. I appreciate my colleagues on the board for their leadership also. At times, we may disagree on issues that come before us, but when it comes to the foundation of Tulare County's fiscal and economic strength, we stand united. While it's important to reflect on and celebrate our accomplishments, we must not lose sight of threats and challenges that lie ahead. The most recent Beacon Economic Report from the Tulare County Economic Development Corporation states, Tulare County has not escaped the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Governor Newsom's fiscal year 21-22 budget predicts deficits over the next three years beginning in fiscal year 22-23. This year has already saw the effects the state budget has on Tulare County when it reduced funding for local si child support agencies. Unfortunately, the $2.1 million reduction to our county necessitated the layoff of 28 positions and 65 vacancies. Thankfully, all displaced staff were offered positions in other county departments. The full economic effects of the pandemic are still unknown. So to maintain the county's strong financial position and enjoy balanced and stable budgets in future years, we must negotiate financially sustainable labor agreements, collaborate with Tulare County Retirement Association to minimize significant retirement cost increases and approach the impacts of the $15 minimum wage increase in a manner that is financially sustainable. I wanna to touch a bit on homelessness. Prior to COVID-19, homelessness was one of the biggest social issues we were dealing with, and it remains in the forefront today. According to the last point in time survey, there are 992 people experiencing homelessness in Tulare County. I wouldn't doubt if there were twice that many. While some may think that the pandemic would have squelched our efforts to provide housing, it actually opened up many new funding sources. Project Roomkey was established in March of 2020 as part of the state response to the pandemic. Project Roomkey gives people who are experiencing homelessness and are recovering from COVID-19 or have been exposed to COVID-19 a place to recuperate and properly quarantine outside of a hospital. It also provides a safe place for isolation for people who are experiencing homelessness and are at high risk for medical complications should they become infected. Building on the success of Project Room Key, Home Key was the next phase in the state's response to protecting Californians experiencing homelessness, who are also at high risk for serious illness and impacted by COVID-19. Local governments within California were awarded funding to purchase and re rehabilitate housing including hotels, motels, vacant apartment buildings, and other buildings, and convert them into interim or permanent long-term housing. Tulare County was awarded $5.2 million. Those funds were used to purchase the Sequoia Lodge Motel in Visalia 
And along with the acquisition of the 99 Palms at Tagus Ranch with the Housing Authority, we now have over 100 rooms that will be converted into permanent supportive housing. Our RMA staff is also working closely with the Salt and Light Village that will provide even more supportive housing in Tulare County. While we consider these victories, there are still many more people who remain unsheltered and who are coming into homelessness even as we speak. We will continue to seek solutions to mitigate this devastating social issue. As excited as I am about what we've accomplished over the last year, that excitement is magnitude as I look to the future. It's been said that the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. And we have a lot of things being created this year in Tulare County. I, of course, cannot name them all, but I'd like to highlight just a few. 2021 will see the completion of our new state-of-the-art co-located dispatch center. Having sheriff and fire dispatch in the same location, rather than a basement and a trailer, <laughs> will improve communication and efficiency. The new Motorola communication system will not only be the lighthouse for the West Coast, but more importantly, it will assist in reducing response time and improve critical communications. In 2019, we initiated a public art program with our inaugural installation at Government Plaza. COVID-19 may have paused it, but I'm excited to announce that we were able to renew this great relationship with the Arts Consortium that highlights local artists. This year, the walls of this building will be adorned with the works of Tulare County residents, along with a mural in this chamber depicting the history of Tulare County. With 2020, census complete comes the daunting task of redistricting. We are currently accepting applications for the Citizen Advisory Commission to assist in the process of designing new supervisorial district boundaries. We look forward to watching the progress of the newly formed Tulare County Regional Transit Agency. This agency is a joint powers authority made up of the Tulare County, of the County of Tulare and the cities of Exeter, Farmersville, Lindsay, Porterville, Tulare, and Woodlake. We are working collaboratively and in the interest of our residents. This JPA will be the trend for the future of transportation throughout Tulare County. Work has begun on creating and opening a low-cost spay-neuter veterinary clinic on the shelter premises, which will increase humane care for animals in the shelter and provide affordable services to members of the community who may otherwise have no access to medical care for their pets. This year, we also started a special pet project, and I mean that literally. We have introduced our pet of the week. We will be highlighting adoptable pets from our shelter, and they will make in-person, or I should say in-dog, appearances in our chambers. So in closing, I'd like to say there's much more that I could talk about since there are so many important issues the county touches, but it's time to continue doing the business of the county. So what is the state of Tulare County? I can say with confidence that the state of our county is strong, and we are strong because of our over 5,000 employees who work daily to meet the needs of our residents. We are strong because of our caring community partners, and we are strong because of our eight incorporated cities, Dinuba, Exeter, Farmersville, Ivanhoe, Lindsay, Porterville, Visalia, and Woodlake, because we are stronger together. And we are strong because of our almost 500,000 residents and businesses who have invested in our county and who trust that Tulare County is the best place to live, work, raise a family, and with the greatest national park in our backyard to play. Thank you for being here today. Once again, thank you to my colleagues and all of the staff, and stay safe, Tulare County. All right. Thank you. Typically, we take a little break and socialize, but not yet. Maybe next year. All right, our next item on the agenda are Board of Supervisor Matters, and we will start today with Supervisor Townsend. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. And by the way, great job on the state of the county. Thank you. 
appreciate it. And I'd also like uh, like my colleagues to share any uh, any goals that they have uh, for this year also. All right, thank you for that. Uh, a couple of things uh, just that we have been doing. Um, back on the third, we had our San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council uh, uh, Valley Voice Day One, and that was our call with uh, Sacramento with some of the legislators there. Uh, and we were advocating for completing our transportation systems, specifically completing uh, the projects on Highway 99, the widenings there, uh, passenger rail, uh, completing that, uh, and also setting real and achievable air quality uh, uh, solutions and standards, um, and not something that might just come from, you know, what might work for one part of the state really won't work so much for the valley and on non-attainment area. And so we think we had some pretty good uh, conversations there. Uh, we met with uh, Senator Anna Caballero, uh, with Senator Eggman's staff. Uh, we met with Senator Andrea Borges, uh, Assemblyman Carlos Villapadua, Senator Melissa Hurtado, and Assemblyman Vince Fong uh, on that day. And we'll have another one coming up. Uh, also that day, we had our local agency formation uh, commission. And in that meeting, we uh, uh, we took care of an annexation for Woodlake uh, into the city of Woodlake, and it'll be for uh, actually a very large park there in that community, along with some future housing. And also in that uh, in that commission meeting, we uh, recognized and uh, and welcomed new city members: uh, Phil Cox, council, uh, council member from here in Visalia, and uh, Mayor Rudy Mendoza of Woodlake uh, joined that uh, commission. On, uh, on the 4th, I had a meeting uh, with Congressman Valadeo's rep, the first meeting, and Clayton Smith, I see you're here this morning. Thanks for coming over and visiting with uh, many of us uh, last week. And uh, we, we touched on a lot of things other than just getting to know each other a little bit. We touched on uh, water needs here in the valley uh, and also farm to market road improvements here. Uh, and then talk quite a bit about uh, forest management uh, projects that we need to, to work uh, collaboratively on. Uh, as well as I tried to schmooze him into uh, maybe making some appearances at the uh, Government Affairs Committee for Porterville Chamber of Commerce. Uh, on the 4th, also, we had our East, Eastern Thule Groundwater Sustainability Agency um, and mostly uh, had some discussions about how to deal with a couple of the communities in unincorporated areas as they start to put out calls for funds um, uh, for groundwater extraction fees, and so that is uh, still in the works. And then yesterday, Tulare County Water Commission, I serve as the alternate or vice chair uh, under Chair uh, Vanderpool. And uh, so I took the first part of that as he had an overlapping meeting. And uh, just in that part, I had one thing that came up to highlight was that uh, in the water tank program for uh, the county last year, we had over 400 water tanks dealing with uh, the drought and some of the groundwater conditions that were out there. Uh, Got a handle on a lot of those, and the numbers as of yesterday were about 28 tanks left in the county. So big improvements, and those will be uh, those other 28 should be fading away before uh, too long. And they also, uh, the commission also uh, set some priorities, legislative priorities, uh, for that commission uh, for this upcoming year. I also yesterday uh, had a had a Zoom meeting with uh, Burton Arts Now Committee. Uh, and uh, they're putting together a program called Burton's Got Talent. Uh, it's really kind of an interesting program for the uh, students that have a leaning towards the arts uh, over in Porterville. And so I've been helping them uh, for oh, probably a couple of years now on that committee and will help as a judge for their Burton's Got Talent that'll be coming up here before long. Tomorrow, uh, I have a meeting with uh, Harmony Magnet Academy. There's going to be an Academy of Engineering virtual tour and so I will be on that and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, my involvement in the past in a mentorship conference where they bring all of the students in high school and uh, middle school uh, together on, on regular years. They come together with speakers. Uh, I've been a speaker, I've been a panelist, so I'll talk a little bit about that and the meaning that that has. Also internships, offering the students internships and having uh, student interviews. And again, I'm really impressed with that work-based learning model that they've been using there, and so I will be uh, sort of touting that as one of the uh, one of the people on that tour tomorrow. And then after that, uh, we will have the Valley Voice 
day two Sacramento trip. So we will be calling Sacramento again with the seven other counties uh, in the San Joaquin Valley uh, to talk about our regional priorities and, and do a little bit of lobbying tomorrow. So that's about it for now. Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, and uh, before I move on, I uh, have to apologize that I uh, forgot to mention the, the city of Tulare as one of our uh, great incorporated cities. And I gave the city of Ivanhoe a promotion, um, but it'll, <laughs> it'll be nice to start receiving um, some more money from Ivanhoe, so that'll, that'll be good. All right, uh, Supervisor Macari, I'll have to fire my secretary, me. Well, good morning. Uh, this last week, I attended a uh, CSAC, uh, New Supervisor Institute training for two full days of Zoom, so that was uh, enjoyable but very informative. I, <laughs> sorry, I, uh, I met a lot with Three Rivers residents. I, I met with the Three Rivers Chamber of Commerce up there. They're starting to move forward, and they brought me a lot of their concerns. I was invited to the home of Kay Burnham in Three Rivers, and she was very, it was very nice to visit with her and, and uh, we actually met with some other people from the community and uh, they shared their concerns and, and appreciation for what the county has, has done for them. Um, the Three Rivers Lions Club, I met with some of their members and um, they're really trying to get their roping uh, program uh, coming up this year, but it doesn't look like they may not make it, which is very unfortunate. The um, I also met with Clayton Smith from David Valdeo's office. It was very nice to sit down with uh, Clayton and uh, enjoyable and, and get an idea on the, on the federal perspective of what uh, the congressman is looking at doing. I met with our lobbyist, Paul Yoder, and uh, got educated on that side of it uh, and uh, what the, their office can uh, assist us and what they can help us with. And it, that was also a great meeting. And I spent all day yesterday on a tour with HHSA. I'd like to thank Tim Lutz for staff. It was very informative, and we went from all over. And it was amazing the, 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 the services they provide for our community, and I, I was very impressed with the staff and, and the, the facilities. Coming up, I'll be uh, covering for uh, Dennis uh, on an RCRC meeting. Uh, that's coming up here. That'll be, what, Thursday? I think it is. Anyway, I'll be covering, uh, we'll both be attending that, and I'll be covering portions when he has a conflict. I'm going to try to make the Sheriff's Department promotional ceremony. There's a, a lot of movement there, but RCRC may affect that, but I will definitely try to be there. Also, I have our uh, retreat call for the Board of Supervisors that we're going to be uh, speaking with a consultant. I'll be speaking with him and uh, moving forward in that process. I, I have not met looking forward to that since I first time here and now I'm involved in a retreat. I'm looking forward to that. I have a meeting at Ash Mountain to meet with the uh, Sequoia Park staff and I will also be attending the Three Rivers Awards at the Teller County Fire Department. Chief Norman is going to be presenting uh, the firefighters some certificates that we signed of appreciation for their uh, response up at the SKF fire in Three Rivers. That's all. Well, good morning, Tulare County. First, I want to thank our chair, Amy Shucklian, for representing us yesterday in early March as she welcomed the governor to Tulare County. Thank you for emphasizing the needs of our county to state leadership. You represented us well. well. And I also want to share, again, kudos to our chair for great information and the state of the county address. Madam Chair, your heart to this county is evident and your leadership is appreciated. Thank you. Last week, I attended the LAFCO meeting with my LAFCO voting members, even though I serve as an alternate, but it's okay. <laughs> and I really appreciate my colleagues for their support on the annexation to the city of Woodlake and the Woodlake Fire Protection District and detachment from county service. I really enjoyed seeing the vision of Woodlake and the potential for a new park in that respective community. Last Thursday, I attended the Latino Caucus of California County's monthly meeting where we discussed CSAC COVID-19 updates, communicated our concerns to Graham Naus, Executive Director, and James Gore, President of CSAC. 
We also received a presentation by SUNY McPeak regarding the California Emerging Technology Fund, a fund that will help support our broadband um, access to underserved communities. Last Friday, I had the opportunity to participate in Read Across America at Castle Rock Elementary in Woodlake. I really enjoyed reading the book, Jonathan James and the What If Monster. I've attended this event every year since I was first elected to the Board of Supervisors, and it is truly an honor. Although that day was a bit different because it was on Zoom, I enjoyed the opportunity to serve. Yesterday, I attended the monthly Law Library Committee and the hashtag Lead Youth Advisory Meeting. At the Law Library, we discussed our budget along with the reopening plans. For hashtag Lead, we continue to discuss volunteer hours, the upcoming STEAM conference, and the EDGE team building activity that students partic participated in virtually. Yesterday evening, I attended the Stakeholder Advisory Group quarterly meeting run by Provost and Pritchard Consulting Group. The SAG provides an opportunity to stake for stakeholders and other related parties and members of the public to provide feedback and comments regarding the City of Dinuba's remedial investigation and feasibility study for options to prevent the spread of certain pollutants in the city's municipal groundwater supply. I also want to um, take this time to really, as, as our chair stated, what do we see for the, the future of our county? Uh, and although there are many, one in particular is a consolidation of Erosi PUD with East Erosi CSD. And there will be an upcoming meeting next month with the state board. It will be a public meeting located in Erosi at the multi-purpose room at Erosi High School. Uh, again, to continue the consolidation efforts um, because we know that East Erosi needs it now more than ever. Um, I've also scheduled monthly meetings with our mayors of the city of Dinuba and the city of Woodlake. Um, and then on Thursday, I have Leadership Northern Tulare County, where I serve as a facilitator for that cohort. And on Thursday, we, our topic for that day's session is economic development, where we will be meeting with the city of Visalia, the city of Dinuba, the county, to learn about various projects that have happened and will happen in our respective region. And then I also met with Valadeo staff member Clyde Smith. Thank you for our conversation. Um, and the work that's being done with the congressman. Um, and lastly, I want to just announce that our, our winners for the Tulare County District, uh, District 4 Women of the Year Awards. This is an event that I've put on uh, for two years now, going on three, and we get to recognize women in seven different categories. So just want a, a shout out and congratulations to all the recipients this year. Your commitment to Northern Tulare County is truly appreciated and recognized. And also want to thank Brian Thorburn, who's in the audience today, for that partnership as well. Thank you, and that is all I have, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Supervisor Vanderpool. All from right. From Tulare. From, from Tulare. You know, I, I have to <laughs> tell you, I appreciate that uh, that correction. That was uh, uh, pretty much what I see as the only blip in your. Uh, State of the county, other than naming uh, the city of Ivanhoe a city when it's a community. <laughs> I, I, I've got numerous communities that would love to be cities too. I'm, I'm sure, sure they but, would. Uh, um, <laughs> a great job, Amy, in your uh, first state of the county, and I think that uh, your vision for the county is shared by this board, and we will continue to work hard together and uh, invest in this county and uh, infrastructure programs so that the lives of our residents will continue to prosper. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to uh, thank real quick the uh, CAO and Health and Human Services Administration for uh, taking the time last week to join me at the uh, City of Tulare Council meeting. Uh, we did make a presentation to uh, the City Council. I thought that presentation went very well um, and resulted in the City uh, joining on in an effort with the County to uh, form a regional vaccination site here in Tulare County at the International Agri Center. I believe that's a, a real jewel that we have here in our own county uh, and could really help to serve uh, the valley population uh, in increasing the vaccinations that are taking place. So 
Uh, really, really was excited about that, and I want to thank uh, the city of Tulare, uh, the city council members for that uh, um, support and their willingness to uh, join on in that effort. Um, tomorrow, there's a meeting of the Tulare County Employees Retirement Association at 8.30. Uh, there's an investment committee meeting for the Tulare County Employees Retirement Association at 10.30. Um, and then in the afternoon, I have an opportunity to meet with several community leaders in the city of Tulare. Um, I'm actually going to be bringing with me uh, uh, Tim Lutz from uh, the Health and Human Services Agency to encourage vaccination efforts uh, in many different uh, aspects within the community. I know that there are uh, some high profile uh, targets that have, you know, obviously the public safety, you've got um, your, uh, the, the nursing, the agricultural workers, medical first responders, all of those folks are kind of the high profile targets of the vaccination effort. But we want to make sure that uh, we're able to get senior citizens from throughout the community to uh, buy into these vaccination efforts so that we can resume normalcy uh, in our county. So I appreciate uh, Tim and HHSA for their willingness to uh, join me in that. And also the mayor of Tulare will be joining me as well. Uh, so thank you to Dennis Medeiros for that. Um, don't forget this Sunday to spring your clocks forward. Uh, that's always a, uh, a day that's uh, special to me. My dad uh, collected antique clocks uh, as a child, and I remember him spending hours uh, uh, fixing all the clocks and moving them forward uh, on that day. So I also want to bring that up to make sure that uh, Supervisor Shuckling doesn't show up an hour late uh, uh, on Monday. Um, on uh, Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, Assistant Sheriff Douglas will be retiring. I want to congratulate him and thank him for his service to Tulare County. Uh, he's been an outstanding uh, Assistant Sheriff, and I've had the pleasure of working with him in, in numerous capacities, but uh, I think my uh, favorite has been on the uh, discipline appeal hearings uh, for um, the county, and I think that uh, I've served on three or four with him uh, during my tenure, so uh, those are always uh, uh, enlightening. Um, and then I also wanted to point out, too, at 1 o'clock here on uh, March 15th, there will be a meeting of the Tulare County Association of Governments that's also available uh, via Zoom, uh, but uh, in-person attendance is also available here at these chambers. So that's all I have today, Madam Chair. Appreciate right. the opportunity. Thank you, Supervisor Vanderpool. Um, most of the week I spent uh, writing my State of the County address, and I still screwed up to Larry, but that's all right. That's where Pete's from. So uh, yesterday, as many of you know, um, Governor Newsom uh, made his visit to Tulare County in early March at one of our um, uh, points of distribution for the vaccine. Uh, I think it went well, as I stated in my state of the county. We have seen a significant increase in vaccine dosages coming to Tulare County. And um, again, I trust that that will remain um, especially with um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine now coming onto the market. I don't want to take too much thunder away from Tim's uh, COVID report, so that's all I will say about that. Um, I, too, will be attending the promotion ceremonies uh, on Monday, and also, well, there will also be a retirement ceremony uh, and a promotion ceremony. And the only other thing I have to say is that uh, on Friday, I will finally be turning 29 years old, so <laughs> that is it. All right, we are going to move on to our next item, the, another one that I'm very excited about, and that is a demonstration given by the fire department regarding new oxygen masks for pets. And I see, come on, Chief Norman, the pit bull of the fire department comes forward. Uh, more like the dachshund or the basset hound. <laughs> That's the basset hound of the department. <laughs> uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, CAO, County Council. Always good to be here. People's pets are the cornerstone of their household. Um, I remember all our family pets growing up, and we lived in a very rural area of Woodlake, and they just become part of the family. Um, early story in my career, and I'll be brief on the story, <laughs> sorry. But um, I'm going to a structure fire, uh, get there, going and blowing house in the kitchen and my captain says hey they got a pet in the back room and i said okay 
So I grab my partner and we go in the back room and the kitchen is fully involved in fire. Bedroom looks pretty good. Smoke's banked down to about two feet off of the floor. So I'm crawling through, getting through here. And all of a sudden I see this huge mouth come at me and hit me in the mask. I thought, holy moly. So reach through, grab, search under the bed, pull it out. Um, it happens to be a seven foot Burmese python. Oh, jeez. So it was not the pet that I had hoped to encounter like a cat or a no, dog. No. So as we start crawling out, because again, smoke's, smoke's banking down, this thing starts wrapping around my arm, and he's big, he starts wrapping around my neck. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm coming out of the structure, and the heat and the smoke have really agitated the reptile. And I get out there, and the first thing the owner says, don't hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> So a uh, couple of my crew members helped get me um, resuscitated and get the bed off of my neck and my arm. But yeah, sometimes it's never what you think. Although we don't have reptilian response kits, these are mostly designed for canines and felines. This was my, uh, Captain Roberts did a great amount of work on this and I'll introduce him in just a second. Um, this is from the Amazon Foundation, formed by Deborah Jo Chiapuzio. She's from Orange County. Um, she has done all this fundraising to get pet EMS supplies to LA County Fire Departments, Orange County Fire Departments, and emergency responders nationwide. She's foundation is made up of Team O2, which provides kits to all departments around the nation. Uh, we requested 30 kits this fall from her. Uh, she immediately sent those to her after the first of the year, and we were able, through donations, through her hard work, uh, she couldn't be up here today. She thought the meeting was scheduled for yesterday. But everything, we will have all these pet EMS supplies on our frontline engines, light and air, and trucks. Um, these kits in two include O2 masks for large and small animals and canines, and we have a set of EMS guidelines with pets, as well as some training protocols. So with that, I will turn it over to Captain Roberts and then Deputy Cabos and our guest canine patient crew. Hello. Uh, I was speaking to Deborah yesterday, and she wanted you need to let you guys know she apologized for not being here. She was excited to come up, but thought the meeting was yesterday. So she had other plans for the day, so she wasn't able to be here. Captain, you can remove your mask if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. Then we can hear you. All right. Um, <laughs> so Deborah has, she wanted to let you guys know that our set was actually her 8,000th 8, set that she's distributed. Wow. Um, and there's several hundred departments across the country that she gives these to. Um, they give us three different sizes that, that we can actually use for different size pets. And it's not just for, you know, dogs or cats and stuff. Um, we can use them for any type of animal that we use. And what makes these sets, you know, apart from other masks that have been in the past, is they actually have a rubber membrane on the back that actually creates the snug fit so that we can actually do supply auction through it and we can use the BBM to bag for the, the uh, animals also. So um, Lucio's going to bring his canine up and show you how they actually work. You guys want to come around? Yeah, yeah come into the well. Thank you. Oh, so, hi. He's been practicing last night so he could show you guys how this actually works. So, and I told Lucio he couldn't put it on himself. So he had to. So the nice thing about it is it creates a nice fit. So that we can actually get you know, get the oxygen to it. In the past, we actually did yeah, a job. It's a two toy, Dad. Yeah. In the past, what we had to do was actually put our, our hand over the muzzle and stick the BBM in the mask and actually force the air in. Uh, now with this, we get a 100% oxygen to each one of the the canines. So it's going to be really nice the fact that. Now, on every fire we go to, every engine will have, a, have these, and we can help our, our, our pets. As Chief Norman said, I've had three rescues in my career, and each time we've had to do mouth and the snout, you know, resuscitation for it, so this is going to help a whole lot better. <laughs> I can breathe already. I can breathe. And if you guys want to see, I brought extra kits. If you guys want to see what they look like, what they're going to be on. Yeah. 
So Emma does these donations whenever we, a request is made to her. She doesn't keep the kits on hand. She actually goes out and finds the money for us. And so the, the donations that come into her are really important. You know, the people go to her site and actually donate to this because she's, she's got another couple thousand requests already that she's looking for the funding. That's what really sets her apart. So it's been a great little project with her. So hopefully these will be going on the engines within the next week or so. Is our plan. Yeah. So, yeah. We've got to get these out there. Thank you. Right, thank you, you Captain. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Deputy. Um, as, as you said at the beginning, uh, Chief Norman, our, our pets are, are very near and dear and special to us. And um, I know I've, you know, I've been on calls in the past and I, I've seen the, the care that are given to to animals that are rescued. So uh, thank you for this and, and for pursuing uh, these oxygen masks. And they just hook up to a regular yeah. oxygen tank. Are they reusable? Yeah. yeah. Good. Great. You know, that wasn't my favorite rescue. That's why I always put those snake uh, removals in the Monday reports. <laughs> and you've been running across snakes ever since, haven't yes, you? I have. Have you, Charlie? Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. All right. Our next item is to receive an update from the Health and Human Services Agency on COVID-19 status and response efforts in Tulare County. Mr. Lutz. Good morning, Madam Chair, board members, CIO Council. Um, this morning's report, I will um, try and go through a little quickly on the front end. I know there's a lot of vaccine updates to have, and um, the chairwoman mentioned some of our, our key highlights in her report as well. I'm excited, I didn't think I would be excited to say, but excited to say at least that um, we were only up 313 cases over this last week. Um, so a 0.65% increase. Um, we also have started to see um, our, our rate of deaths um, trickling back down. Um, we had a total of 10 last week. Again, 10 too many, but certainly um, far better than the um, 50 plus that we'd been seeing um, in some of our prior weeks. Um, our current active cases have kind of stabilized around seven to 800. Um, and again, kind of depends on infection dates and um, the recovery. But um, again, kind of getting back to that um, level that we were seeing prior to our fall surge. Which brings me to um, total weekly cases down 32.15% from our prior week. Um, certainly a, a significant number in that, um, that brings us to um, where we were at for our weekly cases prior to our fall surge. And if you go um, even farther back, um, coming back to kind of where we were at um, right before our first surge in the summer of last year. So um, overall, um, weekly cases looking much better than they have been. Um, our case rate, um, 9.6 per 100,000. And then um, when you look at the state's case rate, um, they have us at 94 um, had a 1.4% adjustment as a result of testing volume. So the state puts us at 9.5, again, all within the range of, of where, where we're tracking. Um, our positivity is actually down to 4.3%. And I wanna highlight the fact that that is the lowest level that we've seen on our testing positivity through the pandemic. Um, so also a, a piece of, of positive news um, in terms of testing positivity at our um, lowest HPI quartile, um, still um, a, a disparity there between our, our overall and that quartile, that showing 5.7%. Um, still a, a better number than it has been, but we still want to continue to, to see that gap close. Um, our, our effective at 0.65, um, continuing to, to stay in that range. Um, showing that that spread is um, decreasing um, in the county. And I'm very happy to report hospitalizations um, down to 42, um, which is a 32% decrease from prior week. And that also is bringing us back to more or less that pre-surge hospitalization level. 
And so uh, overall, our metrics are trending in the right direction. Um, as I noted, our testing positivity is the lowest that we've seen it. Um, our case rate is getting close to that low point as well from where we've been, at least um, when we've had widespread testing and, um, and monitoring. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize that it is crucially important that we continue to think about testing. Um, we continue to see that decrease at our testing sites, um, very, very low volume. We're, we're evaluating our locations, deciding on opportunities to mix things up, um, emphasize testing. But I, again, I think the, the key piece for, for all of us to remember is um, it does impact our case rate. It, by testing more, it helps us get to that red tier faster. Um, and so we really want to encourage people to make use of the, the resources. They are free and, um, and, and really, um, you know, the, the best idea or practice is to kind of develop a, a regular rhythm of I'm going to get tested every couple weeks. Um, this is particularly true if people are participating in any gatherings, activities, now that more things are happening in the community. Um, engaging those in those higher risk activities, it's a great opportunity to just have a regular testing interval. So when we look at our um, vaccinations, um, yes, as of as of yesterday, we were at um, 62,086 county residents that have been vaccinated. I mean, that's a, at least with the first dose. Um, total doses administered um, has been 87,955. And then our doses received 98,175. Our series completion rate, we're, we're changing our language a little bit because um, as we start to roll out the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, because that's one dose as opposed to two, um, we're tracking it by series completion, not second dose completion rate. Um, we're at 41.7%. Our call center volume has been going down, um, and that's not necessarily surprising. We know with my turn, unfortunately, um, people can't call our call center to get scheduled, and they have to call the, the my turn call center. Um, that does still create some confusion. I know there's a lot of confusion, particularly on second doses. If anyone has not um, gotten scheduled for a second dose, um, please do call the call center, 685-2260. Um, that those call center staff will um, help make sure we get those those individuals scheduled for their second doses. Um, and I know Moderna, because we're at the tail end of our phasing out as a county using Moderna as opposed to our providers, um, we're linking a lot of those individuals into our providers that are that are um, using Moderna and are coordinating with us to make sure they get their second doses. The, um, for our pods, again, we're, we're seeing more activity on, on that front. We um, are doing our first pop-up pod this week in Lindsay at the Lindsay Wellness Center that we're going to be operating there for two weeks. The, um, the goal there, that's one of, when, when we look at the additional allocated doses that we've received through the state, um, equ equity is a very, very um, crucial piece for us on our targeting. So what we're looking at now is, is really starting to do um, pop-up locations across those, those zip codes that are across our county um, to make sure that we are bringing vaccine that we're being allocated for those groups directly to those groups within their zip codes. Um, so we are developing future plans, looking initially in Goshen, Al Paul, East Porterville, um, Pixley, and Traver. Um, but again, we have a lot of different um, zip codes and areas, some unincorporated, um, some, um, some either in cities or, or pockets within um, some of our, our cities that we're trying to get out to and really canvas those areas for um, increased access to vaccine. We're, um, there's a lot of um, ideas that we're putting out there in terms of developing, um, I don't know if I like the term strike team because I think it conveys the wrong message, but um, a, a, a really lean team that is going to be able to go to neighborhoods, really canvas an area with the help of our partners, 
um, and try and vaccinate those, those communities. Again, recognizing that in some cases, uh, we really need to be going to our community rather than expecting our community to come to us. Um, and then we continue to have our partner sponsored and public health pods. Um, excited to say when we looked at kind of the inventory across Tillery County, um, we have about 45 locations where people can get vaccine, whether it's um, their pharmacies, whether it's through their um, health care providers, um, whether it's through our locations. Um, so we, we continue to look at how we can expand access. And I know right now a lot of our partners are doing um, a lot of vaccine for us. And we like to see that, but we also want to make sure that we're targeting um, the groups that we want to. And within our zip codes, we're making it accessible and easy. Um, our Optum sites do continue to operate Dinuba, Early Mart, Porterville, and Woodlake. Um, I, and I do want to emphasize, I know there have been frustrations with Optum sites. Um, I can say our staff have worked a lot with the Optum teams to try and address those, those concerns. Um, because this is a state contract, it makes it a little complicated because they follow what is basically the rules within, their, within the state guidelines. Um, one of the issues is they are asking for identification at the sites. Um, that has been a state requirement, um, and we're elevating that question to the state, recognizing that um, from our perspective, that presents a potential barrier to access. Um, it's important to note that although they are looking for identification, they will not turn people away if they do not have it. Um, but again, the fact that they're asking for it and we're concerned about um, some barriers that that might be placing. Sure, absolutely. All right, I was gonna reserve my questions to the end, but this one in particular um, is something that I want to address. So with regards to the Optum sites, do we have any county employees that are there stationed while the state is running that system? No, I, um, we checked, we, we've assigned a Maxim resource, um, which is a, a um, temporary agency that we use for staffing um, to assist at the registration point, but um, we don't actually have county staff on site. Okay, because the reason I say that is that I know with the Woodlake site, it has been going through a lot of challenges and one of the things that I would recommend is that we do have a staff member on site to be the in-between or the support for residents. I know that many people have been turned away as a result of the state maybe closing shop um, or not having the registration online. Um, so again, this is just something that I wanna recommend because many times we do have maybe employees from the state that are coming into these communities and my hope is that they collaborate, they encourage, they uh, communicate with our residents and, and not necessarily just come in and say, okay, this is what we're doing and then leave. Um, so if we can encourage the state employees that are going to these Optum sites to work, that they do so in a collaborative way with their respective counties that they're there uh, to, to help support. I've just been seeing a lot of back and forth with county, uh, with state staff, either not showing up or uh, not opening up the system in time for registration. So just wanna encourage that. And again, going back to if we can at least have a staff member there for any concerns or questions that may arise. And I, uh, and I appreciate that. And I recognize um, probably each of the board members in your respective districts where we have an Optum site have probably received similar concerns where um, they make a decision to close a clinic or, um, or there's, there's an issue with their appointment system. Um, and I, I agree that we need to look at how do we better support these sites. Um, they are a state resource. We don't want to turn that away um, because they also come with their own allocation. Um, this was one of the hesitations of initially when we were offered the Optum sites, we kind of said, mm, you know, sometimes it comes with more work than it, yeah. than it really is as a benefit. The fact that it did come with additional allocation for us was enough to say, you know, we'll, we'll work through the logistics, but I do think we need to look at how we support that and make sure that we're, um, 
that regardless of what site they go to, state run, independent provider or county, we want our residents to have a good experience as seamless as possible when they come to one of the vaccination sites. Exactly, and that's why um, for me at least is, yes, a lot of these concerns are coming from the state and not necessarily from the county, but we as a county cannot just turn around and say, okay, it's the state's fault. Um, I think we also need to be there in order to make that bridge possible with the residents, the city st staff that are there that are housing us at those respective communities, and then also with the state as well. Madam Chair, I was just going to make a comment. I, you know, uh, Tim, I do want to just say that uh, um, I, I think that the Optum Serve sites, although they may have their complications, are certainly welcome uh, in the unincorporated communities that I have heard experiences from. So. Uh, personally, I, I know that uh, they are located in, in early Mart, and I have not had any high-level issues like what you've uh, had uh, brought up with you know, the state not showing up uh, for a, a day of appointments, those kinds of things. While I do think that consistency and county support may be helpful, uh, I just think that it brings a level of access that wasn't there absent the Optum Serve presence in the community. So, Early Mart is servicing Alpaw and Allensworth and some really isolated areas that may not have had uh, vaccines really being in the forefront, and they also come with their own allocation of vaccine uh, doses with them. So um, yes, there are issues. Yes, we need to make sure that there's a, a seamless effort going forward, but at the same time, um, I want to make sure that we don't, you know, spurn them away and, and make them uh, go back to where they came from or go serve another uh, another county, another jurisdiction, because the need is, is great in uh, these communities. And, and I think they're doing a, a good job where we can support them and maybe help to enhance, uh, making sure that they're actually showing up or um, not having the difficulties makes it a little bit easier on us. I agree with Supervisor Valero, because it, we can easily blame the state but a lot of residents don't really care if it's the state or the county. They're going to blame um, whoever. Uh, and, and I don't want that to reflect poorly on HHSA or the county and the work that your team's been doing throughout this whole pandemic. So um, I understand the importance, uh, and we have to walk that finely because I believe that uh, it really is a benefit more than it is an inconvenience or a, a difficulty. Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tim, just going to back up just a little bit. Um, you had given a lot of good news. Thank you for that. That was nice. I'm sure you were relieved to give good news <laughs> for once. Uh, one of the things that was that, that really stood out was that our effective rate uh, is 13 percent better than the rest of California, California in general. Uh, so it's one, one of the times that we've been kind of leading the pack in a, in a positive way there. So happy to see that. Uh, and thankful that, uh, that the governor did, uh, the governor's office did hear the calls from all across uh, the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I know there are many organizations, including you know, this board and, and the, the eight San Joaquin Valley counties asking uh, for more attention to be paid for the farm workers. I know it was said from, from this day several times and uh, that they finally came, came through with that and are uh, scheduling those. I know you're gonna do a little more reporting on it, but I thought that was good news uh, to see that we were uh, kind of hitting right at a vector that has been uh, highly affected. And uh, so glad to see it. Um, a quick question, uh, you had mentioned the, the testing trending going down, and I've noticed when you drive by the, some of the pop-up testing sites and, and the mobile testing sites as well, well, and the stationary, there's not that many people there. Uh, it's kind of becoming a, a passe thing. Uh, as you stated, it does uh, ten, it causes our uh, case rate number to be artificially inflated if we're not testing with the state average. Um, I'm wondering, since now the hot ticket is to get vaccinated, should we combine the sites? Should there be, would it, would, would we be tripping over each other if we were just to put them side by side and say, come to this location, get tested, get vaccinated? Maybe that might help. Those are um, definitely some, some things that we've been having, recognizing that, yeah, that, that large scale site for people to go to isn't as, isn't as, you know, in demand right now. And so maybe there are those, how do we do like a leaner testing site where people can, you know, get tested at the, at the same locations? 
um, we, we definitely recognize we want to change that mix up. We're working since we're having a lot of school sports coming back and some of those sports do require testing requirements. We're wanting to work closely with um, the schools and other organizations to make that as easy as possible. Um, recognizing that um, some counties, they've been able to um, really help keep their testing volume up because they're testing through their schools, um, particularly if they have universities doing a lot of, of testing there. We don't have the advantage of a, of a university necessarily to be testing to that level, but we certainly have a lot of um, schools and sports programs that we can be working with to help um, make sure we reduce barriers to testing access. Good deal. And just, since you brought that up, just a quick follow-up. I was going to save this for the end, but uh, on the schools, you know, the, the last several weeks, you know, first we'll be talking about, uh, you know, what would it take to get uh, above sixth grade, you know, open, and, and then we went into, kind of shifted to talking about sports became uh, sort of the topic they were into. And then uh, this week, we've been getting a lot of calls about the cheerleading squads uh, going out to the sports. So um, I looked it up on the, the state site, and it looks like the state's saying, uh, not until you reach the red tier. I, I, am I reading that correctly? Um, in terms of cheer competition or? Um, well, the sport, sports being allowed, but, but can, can cheer squads go or do they have to wait till we get into the red tier? And the reason it's being asked is because there were reports that some counties are allowing it and the inference there is that uh, there is some local discretion and I maybe want to either dispel that rumor or just tell us how it really is with uh, with cheerleading squads. Yes, and I, I appreciate the question. I know that's one that I know a number of, of you have received. Um, I've also received it. Um, so the way that the state has defined cheerleading is you have cheer competition um, and then training. All of those would be eligible under the sports guidance. Where the, the state makes a differentiation is for sporting events, they do attendance limits for how the, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for, you know, basically spectators to the, the players. The, the challenge then is the cheer squads fit into that ratio, so that's where it comes into why, why the state says um, to just be basically support a, an event, they consider them to be spectators. Um, we have heard that Kern County and Fresno County were allowing it. I know we checked in with both, um, heard back from Kern this morning, and that they're not allowing it, but I also don't think they're necessarily prohibiting or enforcing it um, in, in a similar way that we've taken with. These are the guidelines. Um, again, schools end up, you know, making individual decisions based on their, you know, their, their school board or their board of directors and um, what they're comfortable with. I'm um, still waiting to hear back from Fresno, but I, I, I surmise it'll be probably the, the same response, which is basically um, some schools might be doing it, but the, the state guidance says this and they're basically following what the state guidance is. Yeah, I think that uh, that's a good clarification that we might want to make as well. It might avoid some confusion, that one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, uh, because it looks like on our guidance that we are saying that, that cheer, cheerleading is prohibited uh, right now, even though the sports are being allowed, I think is what I read on our guidance. So it varied, it looks like it varied from the state a little bit. And so I, I guess a recommendation would be maybe to, to include that to say, the state's guidance is is one to one, and we're just considering cheerleaders as some of the spectators, and then they can make the decision on who gets to go. Yes, and I know we had um, similar questions on multiple team sports. Um, some people that might be participating in two or three sports. Um, the state guidance is a I can't remember the exact language I used, but I think it's strongly it's encourage or you know basically only being on one team. We, we mirrored that language and that it, it's a best practice, but it's not a requirement. So certainly um, you could have people participating in multiple sports. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that some school districts, as I, and I know some have, um, have specifically put in additional limits or, um, or not bringing some teams back. 
Um, again, those are entirely school board based as opposed to um, any decision that, that public health is, is making or advising. Right. Thank you for those clarifications. And also, I'll, I'll back up one more time and thank you for the clarification on school bands and choirs. Uh, there was, that was kind of the topic last week. And, uh, and, the count, and, and you and your staff did respond to that and put up some clarifications. And that's very appreciated. Of course, no, we, again, we recognize to this, particularly since we haven't had a lot of our, our school, our, our, our youth in school, um, you know, didn't think we'd be having to make a choice between, you know, education and, and sports, but again, getting the opportunity for them to be engaging in activities that have been um, long overdue to come back. And we don't want to be standing in the way of that either. Supervisor Valera, you had another question? Just quickly, I wanted to echo what my colleague uh, Pete Vanderpool had shared. And, and clearly, yes, we welcome the state resources where the resources are none. Um, and so that I give kudos to, especially the OptumServe site in Dinuba that operates us too as a testing facility and as a vaccine site. So kudos to Dinuba, but I'm just saying, we need to spotlight those that are having those challenges, i.e. the city of Woodlake, to make sure that we can be there to support where there is that need. Supervisor mm -hmm. McCarry, did you have a question? Sure. Tim, I want to thank you again, and, and I kind of want to echo on what the Supervisor Townsend discussed, because we're getting hit for not only sports, but choir and band and, and you name it. Um, it's still my understanding that we are not being more restrictive than the state. Is that correct? That is correct. So I, I don't know, and I think we discussed a little bit. It seems that there's some confusion because there's still some school boards that are blaming the county and the board of supervisors for being so restrictive. And uh, I, I got a response. I send it, and it comes back. And the last one I saw is that some school board wanted, wanted me to read something in particular. I, I think there's a misinterpretation that. I, I don't know. I know we tried it once, and that caused a lot of confusion, but there may be something, if we can put something out, again, just to clarify that we are not being more restrictive. I actually started forwarding the public health from the state and said, here's the guidelines, and that's what we're going with, but there's still the, I guess, perception that we're being more restrictive, so I don't know how we can do something to clarify that. You can only do it so much, and I understand, but uh, that seems to still be a, a confusing point for some. We were, um, and I neglected to hit on it, but this Thursday we were planning to do another town hall. Um, I recognize that the questions have been coming um, pretty fast and furious on um, on sports, on um, you know choir band. I think that would be a good opportunity for us to really highlight that again um, on our side and also talk about um, as we edge closer to that red tier, what changes the red tier um, will entail in terms of, of sectors opening and different types of activities. So I, I think that's a good opportunity where we can hopefully provide clarification of this is what the you know, health department stance is, this is what the state guidelines are, um, but there is this certain level that it is school board or board of director um, discretion. And it's my understanding yesterday that the governor had indicated a, a leaning more towards some local control. Is that? I'm, I'm sorry, could you one more time? It's my it. understanding that the governor had indicated that he was leaning more towards local control. Is that correct? Um, no? <laughs> I, <laughs> the, the state says that a lot. Um, sometimes it, it <laughs> plays out that way, sometimes it doesn't. I, <laughs> well, I, I understand. Uh, I'm just curious if there was anything that uh, that was discussed or maybe some options where we can start uh, implementing, getting some more openings of schools and if that local control is truly coming to our way. On schools, the state has kind of gone in the opposite. Um, they've taken a more state-based approach when they removed us even being able to approve local waivers. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's why I say, you know, sometimes the state talks local control, other times they, they kind of talk statewide um, control. Right now on schools, unfortunately, they are pretty exclusively on, on statewide controlling um, those, those reopening um, thresholds. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. um, you know, I, I just, since we're here, I mean, we're, we're 
jumping into the school realm right now, and uh, you're not even there on your report, but I might as well do it. Um, so I appreciate my colleagues bringing up uh, the cheerleading advocacy. Um, you know, I got a call yesterday from a constituent and said that, hey, I didn't think you, were, you guys were in charge of cheerleading. And, you know, I don't think we are either, but um, there's a level of confusion out there about that. But, you know, j just want to make a global statement. You know, one thing that has really been neglected throughout this whole pandemic is the advocacy for youth. Um, and I believe that uh, we are going to see uh, the consequences of this social isolation and the uh, remote learning and everything else that especially uh, students uh, in grades 7 through 12 have been dealing with. We're going to see it for a long time. Um, and our mental health uh, hospitalizations or inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations have been uh, increasing as well in that population. But, you know, amongst kids, you know you have children. I know I have kids. Every kid has a different reason for wanting to go to school, whether it's an actual class, whether it's a school club, choir, uh, drama, art, or a sport, cheerleading, whatever it may be, kids are drawn to school for different reasons. But at the end of the day, they all get the outcome of a school experience, which is helping them to get ahead in their life. And so I think we have to make sure that we are clear in our guidance um, and, you know, obviously you want to reiterate what my colleagues have mentioned, that we don't want to be any uh, more restrictive than the state, but at the same time, we need to encourage and push as much as we can to fight for the kids here locally where we can assert local interpretation or local autonomy uh, of the state's guidance, um, because that, we, we really haven't done that so much up to this point, uh, and we're seeing the effects of not doing so. So I just want to make that point. Thanks. Thank you for that. And as I preview into the end of my report, I'm very concerning where our youth hospitalizations are back up to the peak that they were at back in September. Um, so it, it has a, a very, very real impact on our community and our youth. Yeah. Um, and, and I agree in terms of statewide, there hasn't been a lot of advocacy, doesn't absolve us locally of being that voice and trying to push for, the, for our youth. So thank you for Supervisor that. Supervisor Valero, did you have one more question? It's your last one for the yes. day. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, do you know when we will be getting the Johnson & jo Johnson vaccine here for the county? Yes, so um, we did receive, I mean, it, I don't believe it's been delivered yet, but we did receive our allocation um, amount. So for Tulare County, we are receiving 6,400 doses of, of Johnson & Johnson. Um, the caveat there is the state released basically what they, what they had, what the a manufacturer had, but advised that we probably won't see another shipment of it for two to three weeks as they ramp up production. So it was kind of what they had in their stores, um, they, they released it. Um, knowing that 6,400, we are finalizing our um, public health has to develop a, a guidance to then administer um, that. They were finalizing it yesterday. It's probably done today. Um, and then we're working with our providers about the best locations to be targeting the, the use. I know our hospitals are very interested in it for discharges, um, particularly when they're being discharged to skilled nursing facilities because it's um, given the, the one single dose that is really helpful. We're also looking at it for some of our other um, difficult to reach, difficult to continue to engage populations like our homeless community, where we know if we do a clinic, we can get them vaccinated in one dose. So we are um, having those conversations with our partners and um, internally about um, the, the best uses and locations for um, that vaccine. Thank you. So um, a couple other things I did want to highlight before I'm, I'm done. What, one thing that I want to discuss is we've seen um, an interest in occurrence of a higher amount of no-shows um, and, um, and even some difficulty filling all of our appointment slots at some of our locations. Um, we average probably about 40 no-shows per, you know, per pods, and this is something that our providers are seeing. Um, we're seeing at our clinics, we're seeing at Optum. Um, and at this point, fortunately, we're not, we're not wasting doses. We're able to keep them, you know, cold, stored for the next day. 
um, that the issue isn't necessarily about you know concern on wasting doses so much as not you know we want to maximize access for people coming in. We do know that a lot of people are saying you know they were on our lists before, like our interest form. We reach out, get them scheduled, and then they've received the vaccine elsewhere, which is great. We're happy to hear that. Um, part of that 45 locations is we want it to be accessible. Um, but recognizing that we're, we're looking at some adjustments, um, particularly now in light of the equity metric on vaccines, we're probably looking at more, um, or I should say fewer targeted by population pods and more targeted by location um, vaccine clinics. So, you know, pop it up in a zip code like with Lindsay, regardless of, you know, what, what group, as long as they're eligible to receive the vaccine, they can sign up through that location. Um, also continuing to boost our, our use of our waiting list and um, getting people in, you know, at that two to three hours before the clinic close, what are our appointment levels um, to make sure that we can maximize the number of available spots out there. Mm -hmm. Why the, the call center is very important so that way we can correlate the missed doses with people calling in for their second dose. Th that's part of it. And, and re realistically, our our rate of people not getting second dose has been pretty small. I mean, last week, I think it was 130. I forgot to pull what it was this week when we're talking about, you know, 62,000 people vaccinated. That's that's still really good. Um, but definitely the second appointments, we want them calling. But also, while we still have some scheduling flexibility, we, we're probably going to send more people to some of our partners, okay. recognizing that with my turn, we can't schedule them anymore. And do you know the why? So I know you mentioned one where they've received a vaccine elsewhere, and so you take them off the list, but then there are others where the unknown. Um, and the reason why I say that is I'll just share with one individual that, that I communicated with and said, you know what, I'm afraid of the second because I've heard that the second has a lot more symptoms. And um, so I just have decided I'm just gonna stick with the one because I got symptoms on the first one. And then when I called to make that second appointment, the person over the phone said, oh, well, did you get symptoms on your first one? Yes, oh, well, you may end up getting more symptoms on the second. And so that kind of freaked him out. And so hence why this person decided not to. But do you know any other kind of the whys in the, uh, what you just stated is, is one of the whys that we have heard in some cases, but by and far it, it's been a little elusive to us of, of we recognize like when we were having employers, like we work with some large employers, we'd anticipate that it was gonna be, you know, say 500, but in reality, the number of employees within that organization that said they're interested in it was closer to 250, 300. That contributed earlier on, so we've made adjustments recognizing kind of the hesitancy rate. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, th there seems to be a lot of factors at play here, and these are people that actually sought out appointments and didn't show up. So we, you know, th that's a frustrating one, and we don't know why. There's, and there isn't necessarily enough staffing to connect to each of those missed appointments of wh why did you miss on the survey. It might be an opportunity that we can do a line list of who missed the appointment, send out a survey monkey, and, and try and identify what factors caused them to do it. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, also, the state is going to be rolling out some eligibility changes um, on vaccine. Um, they're updating the eligibility within that phase 1B to include um, homeless population, those living in congregate shelters and settings, including the employees, public utility workers, transit drivers, um, and informal child care workers. That informal child care workers is, is heavily geared toward like, you know, grandparents that are caring for, for children or other types of situations where you have, you know, a family or a friend, um, you know, watching those, those children consistently. Next week, we also do begin the rollout to the 16 to 64 um, with underlying health conditions, placing them at greater risk for complications from COVID. So we expect, 
you know, right now we're, we're struggling to fill all of our appointments. We expect probably starting next week, we're going to see that bump up again. Um, but our, our hope again this week was trying to get a lot of those people in that are, have been waiting and still have not received um, the vaccine. We're a little over 32% of our educators in the county. Um, we're um, over 50% on our 65 plus. And um, right now we're really trying to heavily focus on our, our ag, um, food and ag community, recognizing that's such a large amount of our population. Tim, can you uh, mention, I know you shared with me yesterday some difficulty and hesitancy when, when um, notifying some of the larger ag employers yeah, and, as far as and know, how many employees they have and how many they're actually getting to and that up. comes to that um, that hesitancy factor where we've um, with our food nag for instance we're working with a lot of our larger employers who are helping to kind of be a regional location to vaccinate everyone within the industry whether it's dairy citrus um, and what we're seeing is you know we know how many employees there there are like we were expecting 1300 on one but realistically, when we get the list, we're getting um, 388, 400, um, a lot less than we were, that, that we know there are. Um, and so we recognize um, that's a huge, huge barrier. We're, we're very concerned about that. And we need to really fine tune our education and outreach um, to try and overcome that, that hesitancy that we're seeing. And then last on vaccine um, transportation beginning um, Monday, March 15th, individuals with confirmed um, appointments for a vaccine will be able to access um, public transit free of charge within the county. Um, really, really want to do a huge thank you to RMA um, and all of the public transportation agencies in our cities for really ass assisting to get this going. Um, we hope to have a location at the um, also at the Curative International Ag Center set up that will be a dedicated route for that. Um, we just need to work out how we do a walk-up line on a drive through clinic when they come on a bus. So um, a couple little hiccups when, when they're coming on a bus, but we're doing drive-up clinics. We don't want that to be a barrier. So we're identifying um, ways that we can address that. And then real quickly, um, I just wanted to mention also modifications that the state is making on the blueprint um, framework. And these are important ones because they will impact us locally. Um, the, really what they're looking at is two primary changes, some sector specific modifications, really loosening things up as opposed to making them more strict, which is, is welcome. Um, but importantly, they're shifting the tier thresholds um, for when we would be in a red, orange, and yellow tier. So the, there are a couple triggers that are tied to this. The first trigger is 2 million doses having been administered to um, that population within that, um, that HPI, that lowest quartile. So this trigger is, is 2 million. Um, state metrics for yesterday showed the state at 1.326 million doses administered. So still a ways to go there, but that's probably a matter of weeks at this point based on the, the rate of vaccination. What that will mean is the um, purple tier will be moved from the seven per 100,000 to 10 per 100,000. Um, if that were in effect today, we would have been eligible for the red tier. The um, red tier also will be widened from four, where it, where it currently is at, up to 10, recognizing that, that purple's changed. When four million doses are administered to that group, additional trigger language comes into place that'll have the red between six to 10, and then um, orange, the new threshold for orange will be below six. Um, to get into that orange tier and then below two to get in that yellow tier. So some, some fairly significant changes just in terms of where there's those tier thresholds are. Um, and, and again, if that were in place today, we would have been eligible for the red tier. So um, hoping again that our trends continue to hold where they're at and um, we'll be able to actually be in the red tier in a, a number of weeks. Um, and with that, that concludes my report. Sorry, I tried to be short, but we went a little long. Okay.
Okay, uh, with that, well, I told you. When to, yes, go ahead, <laughs> Supervisor Valero. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, it's just that I'm very passionate about this I issue. I know, I'm but, just um, a hard time. Just uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, because this was just provided to me in real time, so as of 10 29, um, and from Wood Lake City staff that said, Eddie, they didn't staff the Wood Lake site again. We have a line of very unhappy people. So I don't know if your staff can follow up with that and contact the state with regards to the Woodlake site. Any other questions for Tim? All right, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is public comments. Members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda under state law. Matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the board at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public is invited to make comments when the item comes up for board consideration. Please complete and submit a comment card indicating your interest in that particular item. Any person addressing the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes so that all interested parties have an opportunity to speak with a total of 15 minutes uh, max. All the, at all times, please use the microphone and state your name and address for the record. And I have two comment cards here, but I see somebody at the podium. Uh, so go ahead and state your name and your city. My, my name is Pamela. Can you pull uh, a little closer to the microphone? My name is Pamela from Visalia. Um, I Last was name? Silva. Thank you. Okay. I was told that I should wear a mask. And actually, masks yes. are required in the yes, chambers. Yes, I understand. So I will make my comment and then I will leave, if that's okay with everybody. Sure, but in the future, right. because we and do have other people someone, waiting, right. and that's I would appreciate you right. wearing a mask for their comfort right. also. But I was just, I was approached and said I should leave as soon as possible, so I'm just trying to accommodate both of that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't speaking on my thing yet. Go ahead. I wasn't. We were discussing. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Can I get my time back? Yes. I'll I'll make a point of that. So I'm I'm here regarding um, item 11. Item 11, is on consent. Are you asking for that item to be pulled? Because yes, I am. Okay. Yes, so I item am. 11 will be pulled. On on grounds that it it also goes on to mention isolation and quarantine. Okay, ma'am. So we will talk about that at the time. We will pull that right, item. Right, but I, do, I need to leave, so I'm trying to accommodate what you've asked me to do. I know, but we will be pulling that item, so uh, you're welcome to, uh, staff right, but, can provide you with a mask or a face shield no, and if that's, you'd like that's to. That's another thing. I have a medical condition that doesn't, will not do for me. So let me just um, get on to my public comment rather than well, argue. You need to wait until the item is pulled. Right, like exactly. like to wait in, in the... In the right. lobby, you can do that. So I'm just asking for that to be pulled, and that was that. Rather than arguing, okay. let me just um, do what I need to do here, and then I will actually leave. Pam, we cannot listen to the comment until that item right. comes before, and right. we will. Right. So I'm done with that, and I have an, uh, I have a different thing to say. Okay. We will pull comment. item 11, and now you have another public comment. Yes, I okay. have. Yes, that's what I have. Okay. So on on the um, the, the mask, I wasn't even going to mention this today, but on the mask, you're saying that I have to leave or wear a mask because it is required, or I will be removed. Is that correct? I would be a public nuisance. So the, the, that's coercion, and it's under duress that I would wear that. And physically, I cannot accommodate a mask. And yet I'm over here trying to explain, look, I have reasons for not wearing one, and yet I have to defend it. Can't you just let me just live my life? Without, without questioning me and telling me you're going to have to leave. I'm not sick. I'm not running a fever. Okay? I'm innocent of any, any wrongdoing here. And it's coercion. It's under duress that you, you force people to, to put something on their face that is against their health. I've seen Amy, I've seen you numerous times touch your mask right up next to your nose. And if you did happen to come across a virus, put it right up next to your nostril so you can breathe it in. That's how it gets transmitted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave now, but I cannot wear a mask. And I'm tired of defending my, my health in public or here with everybody. 
we need to have the freedom to say, no, I, I need to opt out and not have to defend it and not each time be confronted and have to explain what my problem is. Can, can we agree on that? Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Okay, do we have anybody else who would like to speak for public comment? I do have a couple of comment cards. Uh, we will start with Scotty Gomez. Hi, Scotty. Come on forward and... Good morning. You can remove that while you're speaking, Scotty. <laughs> she kind of made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm here once again. My name is Scotty Gomez. I'm from Woodlake. Uh, I'm with IHSS Workers for Tulare County. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to, to say I love our county, okay, and I love everything. I, there was a lot of positive feedback here, but I would really like you guys to focus on, on IHS as workers and how important we are. And I'm gonna, I have some handouts for it to give to you, but I'm going to read what, what they wrote with it, and it's, well, it is a bunch of signatures, but it's from everybody around, not only here, but in other counties too. And, I'm frustrated that Fresno County gets a higher wage and a medical benefit, and we don't. So, so it says to the Tulare County Board of Supervisors, IHSS supervisors are working on the front lines caring for Tulare County's most vulnerable. We are told they are, that they are essential, but they have not been treated like it. IHSS providers are risking their lives every day, keeping our elderly and disabled out of the hospital. We know that COVID-19 has not gone away, so why isn't the Clare County Board of Supervisors doing everything it can to stop the spread? And before I go further, I know you guys are working diligently on trying to do everything, but you're, we feel like we're being left out and slip, we've slipped through the cracks here. So we want a fair contract now. Heroes deserve a hero's pay. It's time IHSS providers in Clare County receive living wages and proper protection. IHSS providers are essential today and tomorrow. We demand that they receive living wages, affordable health care, and proper protections in hope that they can prevent themselves, their recipients, and their families from getting sick and so that they can afford health care benefits in case they do. The time that we're looking at IHSS workers is over. Prioritize home care workers now. We demand living wages and proper protections for our Tulare County IHSS providers. I know I have one for each of you. So, you want me to bring them? Clerk, um, Madam Clerk, can you grab a copy mm -hmm. of that from Scotty? Thank you. There's one for each. Thank you. And that's my only comment. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Scotty. I, I just I want to remind you also that IHSS workers are. Um, available to get the COVID shot. So I just want to, you know, yeah, on the list. <laughs> give you that increased I'm, protection I'm, also. To, so you all know that. Yes, I am on the list. Thank you. And thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Our next one is Ulysses Castellano. Hello. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Ulysses Castellanos. Um, I want to start off by saying that um, we acknowledge uh, your movement, uh, the work that you guys do for, for the community, like we just saw right now. Uh, you guys get lots of ask from different people in the community. Um, but I'm here on behalf of other IHSS providers that couldn't make it today. Um, they also hear that uh, other counties, smaller counties, are offering uh, livable wages towards the IHSS program providers. Uh, just how Ms. Scotty mentioned, um, we, we've been hearing that a lot. How, how come Fresno is getting paid a, a better wage than we are here? We're doing the same uh, type of work. We're caring for disabled children, for disabled adults, for elderly people. Uh, so I just want to bring that up again. And I, I also want to bring this up. Uh, we acknowledge the movement you guys already made, but it's still not enough. Uh, a lot of us have uh, pre-existing conditions. We're taking care of these elderly people, taking them to the hospital, to the doctor, to the pharmacy, but we don't have no healthcare insurance to protect our own selves. If we ever fall sick, who's gonna take care of our grandparents? Who's gonna take care of that disabled uh, son that's now 50 years old, that both of their parents died? Who's gonna go take care of that disabled person if we can't go care for them if we're sick? So we just want you guys to think about that. And again, we acknowledge the movement that you guys already made, 
but it's still not enough for the work that we do. Uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you, Lucy. Any other public comment? Madam Clerk, do we have any phone calls? We do not. Okay, that closes our public comment period and we will move on to the consent calendar. Uh, other than item 11, are there any items to be pulled by my fellow board members? Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So we have a motion to approve the remainder of the consent calendar by Supervisor Valero, a second by Supervisor Vanderpool. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Um, item 11 is to approve an agreement with Valley Health Team Inc. for COVID-19 testing and contact tracing services that will be administered in amount not to exceed $300,000 effective March 9th, 21 through December 31st, 21. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, are there any uh, questions or comments from the board? I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion by Supervisor Macari, a second by Vice Chair Valero. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. On to item 15, which is an untimed item. This is a request from the County Administrative Office to approve revisions to the bylaws for the 2021 Advisory Redistricting Commission. This item is also scheduled as a closed session item. Madam Council, do we need to... Um, Convene to closed session. Um, okay. You're I'll up, fast, John. Then. Yes, uh, this item is a request to amend the bylaws the uh, for the redistricting commission. The U.S. Census has delayed the release of the information another time, so it won't be received until September of this year. So we are asking the board to change the bylaws to allow for that flexibility of the ever-changing uh, deadlines. In addition, we want to ask the board to clarify the eligibility for membership on the commission, specifically that uh, members would be eligible based upon the registration of their voting, where the registered to vote would be based upon how they get on the commission. As in addition, the uh, board is being asked to reset the deadline for the commission application, so that'll be a conversation uh, to be had with the board, whether or not we continue to keep it on March 12th as previously uh, set or do we want to extend it to allow for additional applications the in addition the state legislature has uh, acknowledged the delays and is likely to advise or provide more time to uh, counties to do the redistricting efforts so with that happy to answer any questions you may have um i have a question john so do we have once we get all the um applications in do we then give that to uh, the registrar of voters to make sure that those folks are registered in the district that they have applied for? Correct. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we go into closed session? Do we, um, uh, yes. ju just wanted to ask, yes. are, so uh, you mentioned numerous topics. I'm, I'm sure uh, the closed session will be dealing with some other uh, aspects as well, but do you want us to have that discussion now? amongst each of the other topics that you've mentioned, or should we wait? Probably all the topics together at the end after we've had a chance to go to closed okay. session. All right, that sounds good, thank you. All right, we will now convene the closed session.
All right. I'd like to welcome you back to closed session. John, you may proceed. So thank you, board. The, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the one of the requests today is to, there are two requests. First is to, uh, let me set my mask off, is to um, approve the requested uh, bylaw amendments, and then second, to set the date for the application deadline, previously set for March 12th, but can be extended as the U.S. Census deadline has been extended multiple times, provide more opportunities for members of the public to apply. So with that, happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Um, I, I would just say that uh, since the census has been uh, extended and uh, that information won't be coming out, I think it'd be fine to extend the application period uh, maybe to April 30th. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, where a person should be registered or ha the language for qualifications to serve on uh, the commission as a district representative should be where the uh, person uh, considers their their domicile, where they're registered to vote, where they live, um, I think that should be a, uh, a clarification that's put in there. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I, I also just want to uh, say I want to thank the folks who were on top of this and did get their oh. applications in on time, uh, you know, knowing that the original deadline was this Friday, April 12th. So, uh, Supervisor Makari? Will we notify the people who met that deadline that there will be extended delay? Yeah, we can we can let them know that it's been extended. Okay. I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, with that, I will entertain a motion. I move that we extend on the okay, motion by uh, Vanderpool, second by Valero. Cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Okay, our last item on the agenda today is supervisor requests. Board members may make a referral to staff to have a matter of business placed on a future agenda. Do we have any requests? Supervisor Townsend? Yeah, this, uh, I need to probably do a little more research, but the uh, solar fields, uh, the large solar fields that we have coming in, I was wondering if we have uh, any kind of ordinance or guidance in place for uh, size, location. Um, in some cases, I know we're using um, existing ordinances, and I'm wondering if they're addressing the, uh, uh, this, the size has been rapidly increasing in the solar fields where you get thousands, literally thousands of acres. And I don't know if we have anything currently, if we need to update an ordinance to, uh, to discuss that, to make additional findings before we move forward on these or not. So maybe just a okay, we'll have staff. Into we'll have staff field. investigate that, and if Thank it's you. something we need to bring back, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, um, with that, I, I one more time, I know Tim mentioned it. Um, I just want to mention again that we will be having a town hall this Thursday night via Facebook Live with the Health and Human Services Agency. I believe it's at 6 p.m. Um, so to get up-to-date information on, on COVID-19 and vaccines, I would encourage folks to Zoom in or Facebook in. Um, so with that, Council, do we have a need for further closed session? Uh, yes, Chair, there is a need for closed session. Items C, D, and G will be taken off calendar. The balance of the agenda will be heard in closed session, and I do anticipate an announcement now. Okay, with that, thank you, folks. Stay safe. Meeting adjourned.
I have an announcement out from a previous closed session for the March 2nd, 2021 agenda item H. The Board of Supervisors took action in a personnel matter to dismiss a person in the position of Assistant County Assessor. The vote was made upon the motion of Supervisor Larry McCarry and seconded by Supervisor Eddie Valero. The motion passed 5-0. That is the end of the announcement. 